Channel 10. <laughs> Yo. Yo. We're back once again. It's the Channel 10 podcast, and we just got off the line with uh, Alfred OBEC, OBSC, and um, we had a pretty good conversation. He's an interesting dude, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would, man. You know, he's uh, he's uh he's been to the afterlife. He came back to, to tell us his story, his journey through there, you know, uh, you know, getting a check signed by Jay-Z, all, you know, every all of the above. Yeah, I mean, and then, you know, being in the in the corporate finance world during the uh, great collapse and then, you know, being the only black man in the office. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah, he yeah he's a he's a really interesting dude, and uh, you know, just uh, I would say he is the epitome of what we kind of you know strive for here at the Channel Ten Podcast, trying to get these stories of these extraordinary people that you know are kind of hidden in plain sight that you may not exactly know too much about. Yeah, and um, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head in his book. Um, you made it a hot line. Um, it's pretty dope. He um he you know breaks down some of the most influential lines in hip hop and the significance of them to the culture, um so you can get that at um one track mind dot com um get it in hardback um in any type of digital format and you know it's very well put together and it's self published so you know I definitely admire his grind cuz um he's out here doing it um you know just like I was doing it and we hope all of you are doing it so um you know before we get into before we uh you know let you hear the conversation definitely can't stress enough go to channel10podcast.com subscribe on iTunes SoundCloud Stitcher Google Play Music Podcasts <laughs> um where wherever you listen to podcasts, you know, just just help us out. Um and um you can go to patreon.com slash channel ten podcasts and uh show your support that way, a dollar or more per episode. And um if you like audio books, sign up to Audible at audibletrial dot com slash channel ten and get your free audio book and your uh free thirty day subscription. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, please be sure to uh, rate and subscribe on uh, on iTunes, on Stitcher. Um, you know, send us comments, good or bad, to uh, Channel Ten Podcast at Gmail dot com. You know, you can always send us some songs too, which you know some people have, and they've been rather interesting. <laughs> wouldn't you say? <laughs> oh man, matter of fact, we're gonna have to uh, to man, just send us some songs, and 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 we might do a little review. <laughs> Yeah. Um, on an episode, um, channel 10 podcast at gmail.com. Um, and then two, you can call us and leave us a message or send us a text. Um, what's the phone number? Give me a second. <laughs> Hold up. I should have this ready. This is very unprofessional. Um, okay. The phone number four, four, three, eight, eight, five zero nine nine seven um you know call us and leave us a comment on the voicemail send us a text and we might you know go ahead and uh and uh feature you on the show <laughs> not feature you but you know we might air your comment <laughs> <laughs> right 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 so uh with that being said let's start the show peace we used to be like see peace. you then channel 10 and we used to think that people would catch on. You know, but if you're not from Queens, <laughs> if you don't got Time Warner or whatever, what up, like, well, I didn't know that. Do it, yo. yo, what up, man? It's a different channel, son. What up, on, man? What up, watch the channel, son. Different plane now, man. It's all good. What up, all good, baby, in every hood, son. What up, yo? CNN, Network Channel 10. It's on again. Network Street Network niggas, it's grown men. Whoa, face, get in your face. Stay in place, yo, crime lace. Cast more beef than Scarface. CNN, Network, Network, Network Channel 10. Network, it's on again. Street yo, niggas, this grown man. Bow face, get in your face. Stay in place, yo, crime lace. Cast more beef than Scarface. Yo. Yo. We're back once again. It's the Channel 10 Podcast. It's I, the almighty A.R.R. Tick in the building. And I'm alongside. Singar Superior. 
And today we have a very special guest with a very diverse resume. Um, currently he has the book out. Uh, you made it a hot line and he goes by the name of Alfred Obiesi. Say what's up to the people. What's up everybody? How you guys doing? Glad to be here today. That's what's up. Um, now, um, you know, before we get into the book, um, we just kind of want to get into your, um, you know, your influences and your um, your introduction to hip hop. So um, where are you from? Um, I've been in Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn and Queens. I'm Nigerian. So I came to the U.S. when I was six. Uh -huh. <laughs> so for the most uh -huh. part, I lived in Brooklyn for about 20 years of my life, lived in Queens for about the other 20. But I'm heavily Brooklyn influenced, put it that way. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And, um, okay, and um, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, um, you know, what were your uh, early musical influences as a child? I mean, you, essentially, the hip hop was such a small, like it was such like an esoteric, uh, I, I would say, population when it first started. That everybody was essentially listening to the same thing. So when Curtis Blow was popular, everybody was listening to it. When Run DMC was popular, everybody was listening to that. So I would say I think I was I was influenced by the same mainstream artists back in the day, even though there was no such thing as mainstream back then, and just kind of what is what it was. But I mean, the Run DMCs, the, the Slick Ricks, the the Marley Malls, Juice Crew, those dudes came. And um, were you um, immediately into hip hop, or, or did you have like another genre that you were listening to at first? Like, I, it was immediately hip hop. Like, I, I shared a room with my older brother, and he loved rock and roll and everything else, and new mm. waves. So like I said, I'm the younger brother, so I have no choice. Whatever he's got on the radio, that's what's being played. But again, even though I was saturated with all kinds of new wave and rock and roll, it's always been hip hop for me since since I can remember, basically. Were you um were you old enough to like the, to uh, remember the blackout? The the black no 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 I'm a, I'm not that old. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was not, yeah I wasn't even here when that happened. I think that's like what mid seventies. I think I got here like in eighty two. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Okay. Now, um, now, um, early on, did you try your hand um, at uh, rapping or anything? And the funny thing is that I never tried to rap. I'm, I've never been, like, a in front of the mic kind of person, so rapping was never my thing. But mm -hmm. I've always been into music, so, like, not even realizing I would end up doing something of, a, like, a music production nature. I've always kind of, like, played instruments. So I started playing baritone horn in third grade and... Sixth grade, I went to trumpet and drums and messed around with the keyboard. So I've always been playing music, but not necessarily like rapping, just kind of like on the music side. Okay. okay. Now, um, now, how did you first start getting into production? So like around, I would say like around um, my sophomore year of college, I started working at a, a, a spot called Elias Arts. And what they did was they, they essentially produced the music for, for commercials. But I was in the finance department. So I'm doing all the billing for these guys. And these guys are doing like commercials for Sprite, Toyota, Lexus. And these are like $24,000 invoices, just like the mix fee, the sync fee, the live fee. And I'm like, wait a minute. One invoice is my entire annual salary. And that, that some starting to get insight that you can make a living making music. At the same time, like one of my real good friends from high school, he's in Hampton. And he's, he's starting to develop like an interest in music too. So he, got, he bought his MPC. So every weekend I would go over to his house and just kind of, the funny thing is I was better at music, but he was better at hip hop production. So it was just, we would just be trading back and forth in terms of like my music knowledge and his hip hop. And, and that's kind of where it started. Mm. Mm. Now, did you um, go to college for finance? Yeah, I went to, uh, started, went to, started pre-med, ended up in accounting and business. Okay. Did you have like an early uh, passion for it or were you just trying to go where the money was? Again, I'm Nigerian, so you got three choices. Doctor, lawyer, engineer. That's kind right. of the uh, <laughs> kind of trajectory. So my, my brother went to law school. I started off pre med kind of thing. So. That's what's up. And um, you know, um I see um in your bio it says that you produce for um for Nas and Damian Marley. I was wondering what were some of your first breaks, um, or your first um, you know, big opportunities that came through when you started producing. I mean, when I first started producing, like I said, it was um, my, the same friend that I was talking about. He was uh, he was at Hampton, and 
he uh, knew a couple of uh, his, some of his friends from Brooklyn. I don't know if you know a DV Elias Christ, mm-hmm. but uh, he used to run with Smooth the Hustler, Trigger the Gambler. So the other day, Christ came over to the crib and he, he basically heard what I was doing and he was like, yo, like I, I hear your direction. You're not there yet, but I hear your direction. So, and he was a mad cool cat too. So we just started like linking up and producing and producing. Gradually, I got better. Then I started random people would just be stopping over at his house on on the humble. So I'm just sitting there upstairs making beats and he'd be like, yo, come downstairs to be DOS effects. It'd be like Jojo Pellegrino, just random cats that are in the industry. So that's when they started hearing my stuff and started taking meetings. But I would say the my first big break as it relates to producing was producing for Christ because after we linked up a couple of years later, like the album I did about four four or five joints for one of his albums. So uh. So then it just kind of snowballed, started snowballing from there. That's what's up. And um, and um, uh, uh, what were those uh, checks like early on? Like, were you still doing finance at the time, trying to juggle the two? No, absolutely. Like, it's it's one of those things where there's a small, I, w- I wouldn't say a small subset, but the Kanye's, the Just Blaze, the, the, the Pharrell's of the world, they are not the norm. So for all the aspiring hip-hop producers, aspire to be that but realize that that's not the norm so as it relates to consistent checks the checks aren't consistent you better have other things going on to subsidize your, the electricity bill so you can keep on producing because if, you, if you're just waiting for that music check until it gets to that point where it's just consistent or that large you're gonna end up homeless mm. so mm. Yeah. keep your keep day job <laughs> until it's time to make that transition yeah, you know, this is like a topic that we that we tend to come uh, back to all the time, like on this uh, on this podcast, like this this idea of like you know being like living in two different spheres, like you know like a like a music sphere, and you have like your your whole stage name, the persona for music, and then you know you're out in the I guess the so called real world with like your real job, and so like um how, how that how how is that for you like nowadays, especially, and then even like you know beginning uh you know early on like in your music career, like kind of going back and forth with your music persona by i guess by night and then you know waking up with your tie on dealing with finance during the day yeah no i mean it's it's completely two different worlds, it's a very hard hat to wear, so to speak, because again i would and I would, I'm working at certain, uh, like, larger financial investment firms. I'm working at Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Lehman, whatever. And I would literally work the long hours, come home, change, grab my keyboard, walk down to my boy's block, produce all night, wake up at, not even wake up, because you go to sleep at 3 a.m., you wake up at 6, and you do it again. And you keep on doing it until you blow. So it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the, you know what I mean? It's something where it is an incredibly crazy balance from a time perspective, from an interest perspective. You're dealing in two different worlds, so it's not like... If you're smart, you know how to find a way to gra- grab some business information and some business knowledge and translate that into what you're doing. But as it relates to, like, direct subject matter, beats per minute have nothing to do with, with month-end financials. You know what I mean? So they're two different worlds altogether. But at the same time, in order to get where you need to get in the world that you want to be in, you're going to have to make certain concessions, and that whatever your ancillary industry is, that's the concession you're going to have to make, whether it's finance or sanitation or post office, whatever it is you do to keep the lights on. If you love it enough, you'll keep on doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and nowadays, uh, I, if I, if I'm correct, you have like an even, you play like an even larger role nowadays, like in your, in your finance career too. So I can only imagine how hard that must be juggling both of these kinds of jobs and being a writer and like being like a writer and having this book out and trying to push that too. Yeah, I mean, currently, since December, I've been a full-time writer-producer. Like, I've, I've been pushing the book. I've been fortunate enough that the book has been doing well, where it's actually been sustaining my livelihood and since essentially subsidized that income, but it was only something I was able to do after I had a consistent product that was bringing in that revenue and also falls into the realm that I love, which is music and, and hip-hop. Now, um, <clears throat> now, how did you start off um, getting into writing? So I'm not sure if you guys remember uh, Lehman Brothers. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, while that ship was sinking, I was on it. So I'm essentially at work all day, and you have all this time. You know, the company's going down, and we're just sitting there, like having nothing to do, going back and forth, just random discussions about email. Tri- like, if you just pick a song about, yo, I don't like the way Jay Z flowed on that track, and it'd be a long-winded email going back and forth. 
And people started saying things like, yo, like, your writing is dope. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? I was in the email. So it kind of started snowballing from that. Like, I kept on hearing from different people just as it relates to, like, random conversations. Your writing is dope. Your writing is dope. So after, like, I had got my severance, the ship crashed, Lehman went bankrupt. I had all this time. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start blogging. So I started writing like around 2007, 2008, and from there I just kept on getting the feedback of your writing is good, your writing is dope, your writing is phenomenal. Then I'm like, wait a minute, I can't not pay attention to all these people saying that there may be something here. So that's when I really started to like develop my writing to the point where it got to the point where the people were essentially saying, you need to put a book out. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so that's kind of where it, where it uh, started from. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and you know, I, I, yeah, and uh, yeah, well, we noticed that you were working for Lehman Brothers, and I was just curious to know, like, how, like, how was it during that time, like, you know, just being in finance period, like, you know, when everything was like going down during that time around two thousand and eight. I mean, it was completely. What the one thing that people don't understand about finance is that it's kind of always like that. <laughs> so that 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 incantation was just the world knowing how finance finance operates, but. They're always constant. They're the highs are high and the lows are low. So it's kind of the ebbs and flows of it. Was, it was crazy at that point in that you're not sure what's going on. There's uncertainty as it relates to your career. But for me, since finance was always my plan B, I was more or less like, more, you know what? I'm about to get my severance. I have this time to, to do what I want to do. So I kind of look at those situations as a benefit as opposed to a, a detriment. I go back to finance when I need money, but if I can at all help it, I'd stay out of the financial world. Uh, mm. Now, um, were there like, um, I guess, because you're talking about the email chains, um, were there like a lot of hip hop fans um, in, you know, your offices? And then, you know, how was it, you know, just, you know, being a black man in that world? <laughs> <laughs> you know the answer to that question. <laughs> It's so funny. My 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 last job, my last job was at Morgan Stanley, and I and I used to say that I had ninety nine problems, and the reason why I said that was because there were a hundred people seated on my side of the floor, and I was the only black male. Oh man! So, so I'm like, how is it? And to me, it was just one of those things where how is it you can walk? If I walk into a room and there were ninety nine women, I would notice. If there were ninety nine Asian men, I would notice. If there were ninety nine Indian, and if there were ninety nine of one thing, I would notice. How does anyone not notice? There's only one black guy here, and everybody's cool with that. Mm. Like it cannot be by coincidence, especially since I experienced it because I'm black. And Morgan Stanley, I was the only black one in on my side. When I was at Goldman, there was four of us. When I was at Lehman, there was four of us. So it's to the point where I'm counting on one hand the amount of African-American males on floors that have hundreds of people. So I'm doing my thing, but in the back of my mind, it's kind of looking like there's no hope for me here. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> read the tea leaves, bro. If nobody in the corner office looks like you, yeah, Barack Obama could be president, but there are 43 other dudes are probably not going to be like Barack. Mm. So mm. I don't know if the one in forty four odds is the odds I want to work with. Right. Mm. Now, um, and, I mean, you know, like nowadays, since we, oh, go ahead. Oh, um, I was just gonna say, um, did you have any uh, awkward moments? Um, I remember reading the book uh, "How to Be Black" by Baratunde Thurston, and he's talking about you know being in that in that in, like type of environment, and like when you have the office party and they have the the uh, fruit platters, like do you grab the watermelon around all the white <laughs> <Yeah>. people? <laughs> No, it, it, it's 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 funny, but there were definitely a couple of instances where there was one day I was told to use the messenger's entrance, and and like it's just like certain things where you're like, you know what? How come? It's one of those things where it'll never be a hundred percent wholeheartedly definitive. Uh -huh. But why why are you always the one that the weird thing is happening to? <laughs> I know it's not because I'm black, but how come it only happened to me? <laughs> After you have those a couple of times, like it's just like you know what, man, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm. So yeah, I, yeah, we most definitely know what you mean. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and you know, like nowadays, when it comes to like you know finance, it, I guess it as, as of right now, it kind of has a bad name. And so we have like all these you know dramatizations of like the world of money from like the Wolf of Wall Street and. Uh, yeah. uh, that that show billionaires on Showtime, HBO, like whatever it is, 
And I yeah. was curious to know, like, you know, you being like, you know, you being of like from that world, um, how do you feel about like these different dramatizations and like negative um, takes on the world of finance? I don't think it's any more or less corrupt than any other industry. I think it's just the current poster child for, for, for corruption in that I don't, no one can name any altruistic industry and be like, okay, what, educational system isn't flawed? Legal system? Medical system? Music? Like, which one do you want to pick and tell me, you know what, I want to be here because everything is hunky-dory? As long as you involve human beings, there's going to be greed, corruption, and that's just kind of the nature of, of man, mm-hmm. in my opinion. So... Like I said, I really believe it's just the latest poster child for, for greed and corruption. But if you look in any and every industry from politics to sanitation, you'll find it. Mm-hmm. That's yes. very true. Um, now, you know, during your downtime, when you started uh, writing the blog, um, did you have the book in mind that you were, you know, that you knew that you were going to do this one day? Now, I, I didn't have the book in mind initially because, like I said, I'm just I'm writing. So I'm starting trying to find my voice. I'm writing about random things and writing about finance and self-help and growth and, and hip hop. But again, you can't write a book about every single thing you love. So I think it was around 2010 where I was just like, OK, if I were if I were to write a book, what would it be about? Uh-huh. And again, write about what you know. I know hip hop. I love hip hop. I've been producing it, but I didn't necessarily want to write a book about hip hop production. So I'm like, okay, what's something that everyone can relate to? And that's if you're of the hip hop culture, after about a few years of listening to music, you start to speak with lyrics. Like it's kind of like there's certain lyrics that will just essentially encapsulate the feeling that you're trying to get. Like, I'm not sure if you guys saw, I'm, I'm sure you guys saw the whole Charlemagne um, Birdman interview. Right. <laughs> but th- during the whole interview, like, after it was over, Charlemagne was like, oh, wow, I guess that's it. Grand opening, grand closing. Uh-huh. So if you don't know that's from a Jay-Z line from the Black Album and blah, 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 you don't understand the 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 root behind it, but it still makes sense for the, like, it's, it's still a comprehensive within the context of what he's saying. So that's what I'm saying. How many of those quote-unquote hip-hop parables that have a deeper meaning that essentially define how we speak are there out there. And that's kind of the birth of you made it a hot line. Uh, mm. Now, um, how, now what was your um, initial writing process with the book? So initially I, I first tried to figure out how many lines are there like that. And what I mean, are there is that if I just said the line, you would know who said it. If you essentially, if you're a hip hop fan, if you're like a, a hip hop, yeah, if you're a hip hop fan, you know, exactly what I meant by it, what the connotation was, where it came from. And that's a hard thing to, <laughs> I guess, try to compile. But in, in a sense, it's almost kind of like an easy thing, too, because we're looking for the most influential. So I'm not looking for the super lyrical MC. I'm not looking for the best MC. I'm just looking for the lines that stuck out for whatever reason in that song. And it's essentially transcended hip hop and now it's part of modern day vernacular kind of thing. So as an example, today was a good day. It started off in a Cube song, but you see it in movies and commercials and TVs to the point where it's just part of the way we speak. So, uh, that's uh, 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 really interesting. So, <clears throat> so um, w- now um, I read somewhere that it took you. Um, you said about um, w- well, some years uh, putting the book together. Um, yeah. So you know now that it's finally out, and I'm looking at it. Um, did you have the idea of having it look like a notebook and like the whole artwork and everything? How did all that come about? Absolutely. So, like I said, once I decided to write a book about hip about hip hop lyrics, mm-hmm. if you grew up in um, if if you grew up in the culture, you're aware that most MCs wrote their their lyrics in the composition notebook. So I'm like, okay, let's go ahead and style the whole, even the the size of it. Cause it couple of things. I know hip-hop fans are not going to read a 400-page book. So that's why I broke it down into certain volumes because I, it fits from a stylistic perspective and that it looks like a composition notebook from a size-wise. So like I said, I styled the whole thing where it fit the format. It's not just about lines. It's, it's essentially a part of hip-hop nostalgia. I'm also a huge fan. I think one of the, the one thing I can't do is draw. So like I, I think I can write, I think I can make music, I think I'm talented in a lot of other arenas, but I couldn't draw a circle with a compass. 
but I love art and I love hip hop art. So I'm like, what would the visual representation of these lines look like? So um, one of my friends who was essentially was like with me throughout the whole process. She's like, you should work with this guy, Sha Wonders. This art is phenomenal. We spoke. He got the idea immediately. He's from Brooklyn. He's a hip hop fan. And after I saw the first sketch, I'm like, yeah, this is completely crazy. Like, we got to do this. So, uh, so, that's, uh-huh. so that's what it was. Now, when it comes to uh, publishing, um, it looks like you publish it through uh, One Track Mind. That's your uh, your website? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, me and my business partners are self-published. Okay. Now, um, now, how did how did you, you know, even begin to, to put everything together from the One Track Mind to, you know, self-publishing it? I see you have the hard copy. Uh, we bought the EPUB. Um, you know, like, what was that whole process and structure and the whole business behind it? I mean, it was completely a, a learning process in that, like I said, I've been I've been writing and blogging for a while. So one track mind is, is the 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 latest manifestation of me and a bunch of uh, content creators, online content creators, who essentially said, you know what, we want to have content that speaks to our demographic. Like I'm not doing the the media takeout. I'm not doing the world star hip hop. I want something that's AFM centric, but at the same time has some, a certain level of intelligence intelli- intelligence to it. Uh-huh. So one track mind was essentially the birth of that, but as you're growing a business, you want to get exposure for that business, and we're also writers. So what makes more, what makes sense if not writing a book that exposes your brand, exposes one of the, the primary content creators of your site, and just have everything have that that synergy, so to speak. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So yeah, it's, it's it's all, and I've been fortunate because, like I said, my my business partners are. The gangster man, like one of them, one of them is my art director is actually an art major. Like the guy who does a lot of R and D, like he lives on Google and and our social marketing, our media marketing guy. I've been fortunate in that everybody's very very good at what they do and on one track mind. So that's why I was able to pull off a a self published book one year after existence. Uh. Man, that's dope, man. Much uh, kudos to you for that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, finally making it out of, you know, I guess what we would call, you know, the rat race and everything. Um, now, were you um, inspired by uh, any other um, hip hop journalists or any other type of hip hop publications? Um, so Justin Bua is actually one of my favorite visual hip hop artists. Mm-hmm. So his book, inspired me from a, from a visual perspective. But like I said, that's the one thing I, I don't do. So as it relates to like hip hop journalist, I would say like the older cats, like the Bones Malone and, and certainly Dream Hampton and I like the more prominent ones. But I, I, my writing influence is more. Oh. I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. I was saying, like, my, my writing influences aren't necessarily, like, heavily immersed in the hip-hop world. They're more like Dave Barry's and then more satirists kind of thing. So I have a few hip-hop journalists that I look up to, but for the most part, the guys who I think my style mirrors them are more outside of hip-hop. Mm. Like, um, I was uh, I was checking out uh, your, uh, your your old your old blog, crazedafrican.blogspot.com. Yeah, and um, I came across uh, this uh, this really funny post. How how young can you die? How young can you die of old age? And yeah. like it's just it's re- it's really hilarious. And so like it, like a lot of these things like they kind of remind me of kind of like the style that like Byron Crawford has with his writing, like really sar- like sarcastic. And um, I see like a lot of that in your book. And so um, I was curious to know like because it seems like within like a lot of your um your writing you have like these like these funny like one liners or like funny like verses that that you'll do every so often, and so I was curious to know if you ever had like um, a kind of idea of like doing like some type of, I guess, sarcastic hip hop persona, like how like D Dot uh, did with like the uh, with the mad rapper or something like that. Yeah. Nah, and it's so funny again. Like I think again, I'm I'm raised in Brooklyn in the '80s, and I'm a smart ass, so that's kind of like ground <laughs> the ground zero for training. So all that just who I am just kind of spills out into the, the book. As, as, as it relates to like that, that level of sarcasm, but in terms of doing a, uh, and to me the book is kind of, it, it is that, and that you're gonna get the the quote unquote the meat and potatoes of a hip hop book, but you're also gonna get the smart ass and sarcasm of me. So it's essentially me telling you the story, like whoever the storyteller is, you're gonna get their personality interjected in that. 
Mm. So I think I, I tried to, I don't know if I'll do a specific, like a, and I've thought about doing that too, like a, just a direct satire of hip hop. But I think this is about as close as you, one would get to like a comedic twist on something that nobody seems to want to ever laugh with or at. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, um, now, are you still uh, working on production? Oh, no, absolutely. I, I mean, yeah, I was actually at the studio uh, last night. I ran into a couple of cats and he liked four of my, um, my beats. So we may be doing something. And I actually did a, um, a beat for the book using certain elements, certain lines from the book. So I'm, when um, Christ is probably going to hop on that, and I'm going to use that for the commercials that we're filming for the book to promote it. So it doesn't stop. Like I said, music production is my first love. Writing is my second, and I'm fortunate that they both intertwine. Mm. So uh, what's your uh, setup looking like these days, production-wise? Oh, I'm um, still using my Triton, but that's more of a controller right now. So Machine is the primary. Um, I, I used to use... I went from... MPC to Triton to the MPC and Triton to Reason. Right now, my rig is essentially I, I use Machine, and then uh, Triton is my controller, and then I dump everything into Pro Tools when I'm done. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, when it comes to um, I guess the uh, engineering side of everything, uh, what types of like plugins or anything, or like what type of little secrets do you have that you've picked up along the way? Of all the little nicks, because I'm, I'm actually audio engineer too. I went to the music school for that. So okay. all, all the little nicks and nacks that I picked up, the one thing, and I think the most profound thing that's been told to me is learn how, learn compressor, learn reverb, learn EQ. Mm. All those other things that are cute and sexy, that's great. But if you can master your general EQ, your reverb, and your compressor, you're probably about 70% of the way there. Like EQ first and foremost. Then everything else is just kind of adding on to it. That's what's up. Now, um, when it comes to um, to the Nas and Damian Marley situation, how did that come about? So my engineer, one of my own friends who's also an engineer, he had an artist, heard my beat, liked the beat. They um they went up to Def Jam looking for a deal. And this is just when, right around the time, Nas had just signed um, to Def Jam. So this, this was for Hip Hop Is Dead. So they, like I said, the artists went up there and they're like, they didn't like the, the they didn't want to sign the artist, but they were like, yo, who did the beat? Mm-hmm. And this is like about two weeks after I just started working at Lehman. So I'm just like, all right, fine. I'll bite the bullet and be an adult and get a full-time job. And here come Nas with the, we want to, we want your track. So I'm like, really? That, that's those are the kind of decisions you're making me make at this point in time? <laughs> so yeah, like a month later, I'm in Def Jam shaking hands with Jay-Z and, and getting my check. Mm. So wow. I, I wasn't mad at that. <laughs> uh, like, like, how did that feel? <laughs> it, it till this day, like, it happened, but there's still those moments of really, like, you really sold the track. And again, I'm not Kanye, so it hasn't happened enough where it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. It's a big deal <laughs> to me. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I'm from a producer community where not every other person sold a track and not, so even they look at me like. But again, it's a hard thing to swallow because it just is. Like, that's top three hip-hop all time. And you got production credit with that dude. Like, come on. And Jay signed the check. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have that uh, frame somewhere on your wall? <laughs> <laughs> it's somewhere filed. It's somewhere. But I definitely got it. Man, that's what's up. Now, um, <clears throat> now during the process of uh, writing the book... Um, and, you know, um, I think I'm not sure about how long ago this was, but um, I read that you you had a, a heart attack. Yeah, it wasn't so much a heart attack. So it was a full fledged death. Like a heart attack is when something happens to your heart. My heart just stopped. I had cardiac arrest while I was playing ball. And I woke up a week later after, out, of, out of a coma. Man. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of a uh, crazy to say the least, like. And then they, they ran all the tests, and the official diagnosis was, we have no idea what happened to you. So they, they ended up, uh, first things first, if there wasn't a defibrillator on the premises, and they didn't know CPR, and I wasn't two blocks away from the hospital, it's a wrap. There is no book. <laughs> there is no conversation. I'm out of here. So, like, fortunately for me, all those things were in play where I was able to be put in a coma where they were, essentially after I got stabilized, they were able to bring me out of it, and then they ran their testing. 
It was like a two week thing. I, I died, woke up a week later, and left the hospital after that. Man, that's crazy. How did that, um, you know, affect your outlook on life? I mean, it gave me a renewed, and I've always kind of had a profound respect for time. Mm-hmm. But and I've been saying it since then. When you lose all your time, you kind of and get it back. You kind of want to use it for the things that make the most sense to you. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like time is uh, unfortunately nothing puts life in perspective like death. And I wish more people didn't have to experience death to appreciate life. But that's just kind of it. And people know everyone thinks they have all the time in the world to do whatever they want to do until their cousin or their friend, and then it's like, oh, my God, maybe I am. It made me realize how m- mortal I am, put it that way. Uh. Mm. So, like, uh, I don't know if this is, like, a stupid question or not, but, uh, like, when you were in a coma, did you experience any kind of, like, uh, like any kind of dream sequences or something like that? Yeah, but they were all drug-induced. <laughs> 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 like, and it's, it's so funny. One of my, Unfortunately, one of my friends, her daughter just had some an experience where she's in a hospital and she's basically like doing the whole recount of the kind of drugs they're giving her. And they're, they're essentially giving her the same drugs that they were giving me. And she, then she states that her daughter's, she can tell by the look on her face, her daughter's having all kinds of hallucinations. I mean, uh, hallucinations. And I'm telling you the kind of, they can only be described as trips, the kind of things that was going on in my head. Like I'm being chased by the blue man group. I'm racing dogs. <laughs> There's so much crap going on in my head. And nothing else made sense but a trip. So yeah, those that's what I remember. Like the crazy, crazy I don't even want to call them dreams, nightmares basically. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, so, no fun, bro. No fun. <laughs> mm. Are you um are you like uh um I'm a bit more health conscious and getting your sleep and all that now? Funny thing is I was. I was playing ball. I was in the middle of a weight loss challenge. <laughs> like, and I'm not even fat to start with. So it's like, I think it's more of a genetic thing because the exact same thing happened to my my dad. Like when I was 18, and he wasn't he wasn't fortunate enough to to survive that. So I really do think it's one of those like g- genetic things where it just kind of happens. And don't get me wrong, I am absolutely health conscious, and I lost the weight and all that. But it's not like I was a McDonald's cat prior to that. Yeah. So, so uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, God. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, like, how long was your recoup was your uh, recuperation after you uh, after you were released from the hospital? Like, I can't. It's so it's so funny. I I wasn't able to walk. Like I said, um, the first I was in a coma for a week. I woke up like that Tuesday. The Saturday after that, I really couldn't walk. By Tuesday, I was discharged. And I don't know what happened, but, like, by the time... They wouldn't let me... On Monday, they were like, all right, now that you've had the surgery, we're going to take you up to um, rehab. I'm like, what do you mean rehab? I'm supposed to be leaving tomorrow. They're like, you're not going anywhere, homie. You just died. Like, we're not even letting you to the hospital until everything is everything. And the uh, they came through and they ran all their tests. And for whatever reason, I was good. So my rehab, even all the home nurses that were supposed to come and check on me, they all came once. My doctors couldn't understand it. Nobody could understand how I went from where I was to back to normal so fast. So after about a month of people making sure I was okay, mm. everyone kind of went back to their business. By June, I'm I was chilling. Uh. Mm. That's what's up, man. It's crazy. You you just have a crazy story, like getting a check <laughs> signed by Jay Z, dying and coming back, um, working in finance during the collapse, like. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot, man. <laughs> a lot. Been an interesting couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, so like, do your friends and family like ever like uh, bring like bring up like your your clinical death every so often? And like, if they, if they do, like, how do they bring it up? Oh, again, I'm a smart ass, so I have more death jokes than <laughs> they can shake a stick at. So you know what I mean? Like, no one even feels away about it. They almost look at me like, come on, man, like, can you please stop? Like, I'm getting uncomfortable. I'm like, what are you uncomfortable about? I'm the one who died. Like, so like, I'm a, because I'm a constant jerk about it, no, nobody really like <laughs> feels, no one walking on the eggshells about it. Like, like I said, everything just went back to normal and, and, and that's just kind of what it was. That's what's up. You still playing ball? Sadly enough, I haven't played ball since. Mm. <laughs> 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 
it's not because I'm scared. It's just because the opportunity hadn't arrived. Like, I played ball once a couple of months after when I was in Vegas, but I was by myself. So I really haven't, like, gotten a chance to, to really get it in. Mm. And being a self-published author running your own company, you don't really have too much time to uh, stop, on the <clears throat> stop on the court when you got to sell books to pay your rent. Right, right, right. <laughs> Um, so when it comes to to to, to one track mind, um, you, you know, what do you have on the horizon in the future? I mean, essentially, like I said, currently we're doing a lot of writing, a lot of content creation, but it's absolutely growing to the point where we're going to do the podcast. We're actually going to start doing a series pr predicated on, on another line, but it's not, it's a hip hop line, but it's not from a hip hop um, book. Essentially, on Kanye West did an interview. Dave Chappelle was talking about when Kanye West was on the show and he essentially got some, somebody calls me like, yeah, because my life is dope and I do dope shit. So we got the idea to do a series called Because My Life Is Dope where we highlight certain people in the community doing, quote unquote, pardon my French, dope shit. So like people who you ordinarily wouldn't know about, like you know about the Steve Stout and the Diddy's, but you wouldn't know about the, the support staff for those kinds of people and entrepreneurs and authors and just certain people who we feel are like really, really doing great things we want to start highlighting them with like a essentially like a little video segment where we can start disseminating to the proper pipelines so we're really trying to t multi one check my media group is going full-blown media and that's that's where we're going in probably a couple of years if not right now that's the trajectory mm -hmm. that's what's up, that's and, what's uh, up and, uh, and uh do you have any um any uh artists or anything too that you're uh looking forward to working with Currently, I am my primary artist. So, right, like, right. because everything I'm doing is geared toward the book. Like, there's an art show coming up in, in, um, at Sun Art uh, Gallery on the 15th. I have another art show coming up on the 25th. Like, the track I did is for the book. Everything I'm doing right now is essentially book centric. So, unless there's some, unless a remarkable situation presents itself right now, I'm hell bent on growing and developing my brand. That's what's up. Mm -hmm. And um, just looking at the book, uh, you know, some of the lines that you have in here, um, it's a it's a very diverse, um, you know, cast of characters. You go from Grandmaster Flash to N.W.A. to, to Eminem and um, even Ahmed. Um, so, you know, I was just wondering what's in your um, your CD change or your or your MP3 playlist right now. <laughs> People are going to be mad at me, but uh, I've been banging a lot of Kanye recently. I've been listening to a lot of Drake. I've been listening to a lot of things that people can't stand right now. Mm. Money making Mitch because I love good production and I, I'm a producer, so I'm kind of locked into the production first and foremost. And I'm not even going to make any excuses for it. Drake's album is good. Ye's album is good. I like Money Making Mitch, and that's just kind of what it is. Mm. Mm. So, what is it about the life of Pablo that you like? Production. Like the production, production primarily, like I know it's not all yay. Like I, I know a majority of it isn't yay, but the production quality of hip hop albums these days is kind of retarded. <laughs> and if you're yeah. a hip hop producer, it's like all the MCs are mad because nobody's keeping up with Kane and Rakim. But I'm just like, yo, it is <laughs> it's crazy right now in terms of like the actual music behind the behind the beat behind the lyrics. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, I agree with that. I mean, I, I mean, technically, I feel like, you know, like 2008, 2009, 2010, you had that kind of resurgence of lyricism through like the Waynes and Drakes and, you know, J. Coles of the world. And now we're finally seeing this uh, revitalization of production through, you know, 808 Mafia and, you know, what Future's doing and Metro Boomin and all those other kind of people. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and, and to me, I think that's the one thing I think people have never really had a major issue with is the evolution of hip hop production. Lyrics people complain about, and there was a point where everything was trap music. And don't get me wrong, once something gets popular, it gets saturated to the point where nobody wants to hear it again. But the first couple of trap songs you heard was pretty crazy. And then, like, everything else, and then it gets be become too much. But as it relates to the production, like, that's what grabs me first. And don't get me wrong, if your lyrics suck, your album is probably not going to make it into the, into the house. But you have a better chance if the beats are banging. Yeah. I mean, like... I would say, like, you know, I had an issue of, like, earlier trap music, like, around the time when when Jeezy first came out, because I just felt like the production was a bit... Lazy? It was just, like, not as, like, it, it was kind of lazy. Like, it was just, like, over overly orchestrated, and, like, you know, a lot of times, like, the Sims weren't really, you know, picked, like, you know, like, they didn't pick, like, the, like the perfect sounds for it, and now you really see people 
you know, really digging for like those different kinds of like sift sounds and sound fonts and stuff like that. Yeah. But again, the funny thing is that the, I think the rise of the South side, South uh, sound kind of coincided with the rise of like digital audio workstations. So cats were m making heavy beats with fruity loops and reason and like all these things that came with the same cheesy sounds. And again, if you don't know how to engineer that thin trumpet and to, and essentially EQ the mids and the lows out of it to make it sound like a real trumpet, a lot of producers don't even realize the whole intent of producing is to get it to sound as live as humanly possible. So mm -hmm. Cass is just like, yo, I'm trying to make a dope beat. No, bro, you're the band. So initially you're just trying to make it sound live, which means you need to understand the characteristics of what making something live sounds like. Because if you think I, this is just a horn, I'm throwing it on there because it, it has a horn sound, but you don't know you need to layer your horns and horns have the, the trombone section and the French horn set. Long story short, if you don't know what you're doing, you're not gonna, it's going to sound like it at the end of it. Mm. So that's why, like I said, trap music had a lot of cats who didn't have too much music knowledge and just a whole lot of sounds. So once they got the 808 to knock, they didn't really care what happened afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, you know, as a writer and, you know, someone with a book about hip hop lines, um, with this whole, I guess, new way that rappers have of recording, like where they don't write anything down, they just kind of freestyle four bars and punch in. Um, you know, where do you see the future of, you know, 30 years from now, even necessarily being able to write a book like this to where, you know, there are going to be these same lines to where people are, are living their life by it or, you know, applying them to certain situations, um, you know, I guess with the evolution of lyricism. I think the golden era will always be the golden era, whether it's jazz, whether it's rock and roll, whether it's hip hop, like that's essentially, there's certain phrases that we say now like a, a stitch in time saves nine and a burden hand is worth two in the bush right they've been they've, you know what i mean we've been saying them for hundreds of years it's not like they didn't just pop up so as it relates to the fate of hip the state of hip-hop there is absolutely nothing nothing wrong with the state of hip-hop mm -hmm. if you look at the lyrics the lyricists that are prominent that have always been prominent since the 90s it's always been the dopest cats so you can hate Fetty Wap and you can hate Future and you can hate Design and everybody else right now. If you, somebody asked you to name the dopest MCs right now, you would say Kendrick, you would say Drake, you would say J. Cole, and not many people would, would refute you. So cats are complaining about the things that they don't like, forgetting that everything that what you came up in wasn't dope either. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't just Nas, Rakim, and Jay-Z on the radio 24-7 when we grew up. There was a lot of dudes that we'd like to forget about and that's why we forgot about them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and I guess, you know, we have to ask this question. Um, who would you put in your top five? <laughs> Biggie J, M, Nas, Rakim. Oh, man, you had that one quick. <laughs> <laughs> so many times, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's like the purveying question I got so many times. But yeah, that that would be my top five. Mm. And then uh, for producers, who would be your top five? Oh, wow. Um, Timberland, Dre, Primo, Just Blaze. Hmm. Number five. That's a tough one. I don't know. Because mm. that, that, that number five leaves out a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> How do you rock without the, without including Dilla and then and, you know what I mean and then and, and Hank Shock Lee and Bomb Squad and like it's number five is kind of tough man like but I would I think I may have to go with Dilla because again you're talking about Golden Era and you're talking about soundtrack then Trap Gold Quest Common L O all these dudes you were you was rocking a Dilla yeah yeah that's mm -hmm. true that's a solid list right there and um. I was wondering also, um, you know, being uh, Nigerian, um, are you are you up on like the Wiz Kids and the Ice Princes and that whole, um, you know, you know, Afro pop, Afro beat scene that's emerging? Not really. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I'm a terrible Nigerian. I'm wholeheartedly African American. <laughs> <laughs> I'm African a lot of the culture. Like, like I said, I love my culture. I love everything. But I'm 40 and I've been here for 30, what, four years. So. Yeah. I'm going to be heavy weighed on the African on the American side and on the African side. With that said, I'm loosely familiar with some of it, but I'm not even going to play myself and tell you I know 
one song from another. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think Drake's new album has you covered in certain certain areas. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, just did a, <laughs> I just did a review on it, and there's a part of, like, I literally labeled it, like, Reggae Drake, where it's, like, three, four songs in a, in a row where everything is very... There's one song that's full-fledged Afro. There's one song that's Calypso. There's one song, like, straight up in our reggae. So he's definitely trying to do with international thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I think... Um, I think his his line, uh, "You only have one, uh, uh, you only live once." That's the motto, nigga. Lo, uh, uh, Yolo. I think that's the newest, um, the most recent line that you have in the book, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that is probably one of the most recent parables that's been added to the vernacular. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, every there's a Yolo flip. There's a Yolo restaurant. There are people who have no business saying Yolo, saying Yolo. So it's just again, it's just one of those things where it just takes on a life of its own and actually becomes bigger than the song itself. That one line means more than everything else, and no one can pinpoint why, but it just is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think it's you know for the reason that you said earlier. You know, your time is uh, precious and valuable, and you you really have to use it to the best of your ability. And a lot of people don't necessarily realize that and i think that's a um you know that's just a, a a theme that's encapsulated so so purely in that small uh line that just seems so simple yeah and and and, and that's essentially why those lines are prevalent like people I'm, people have echoed that sentiment a million and one times but for whatever reason yolo is the messenger that's going to carry it throughout our culture yeah I mean, you know, I mean, thinking about that line and, and you know, who said it, you know, I th I'm now thinking about it, I think it makes a lot of a lot of sense why why Drake, you know, said that line is based, especially based on like the subject matter in this last album. I mean, it just kind of sounds like he's crying out for help sometimes, but that's that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, it, I mean, that I mean, this is like his. Uh, See, I have this thing like, uh, like if uh, if you're reading this is too late, that was like his Grammys album to date, and then this one is like his most wow. depressing album to date. I would say, <laughs> like it's a it's a really sad album in certain parts. I would say that's so funny, man. Like, and to me, I don't know. Like to me, it's just it's just Drake. Like it wasn't anything good or bad about it. It's one of those things where like I, I liken this album to like your favorite restaurant. If you like, if you go into this restaurant for oxtail and rice and peas you they make it the same way all the time you're gonna get it the same way all the time you don't have any problem with it. you're not gonna go into the restaurant and go yo although you make oxtail and rice and peas all the time great what up with this curry chicken i didn't go you didn't go to drake for curry chicken you went to drake for drake so i don't know why people get mad that yo this drake album sound like he ain't grow bro this <laughs> drake album sounds like drake <laughs> like, <laughs> if, what were you expecting hardcore rhymes his last five albums didn't have that. Why? What do you like? It's the expectation I think that kills a lot of hip hop. Like what people think people should be instead of what they proven themselves to be over and over again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, whatever he's doing is working for him because he got number ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody should be knocking Drake. He's basically trying to figure out how to be Drake. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, now um, for volume two, do you have any um, any lyrics that you're thinking about for the next one? Oh, like when initially when I compiled the list, I got to eighty lines, so that's why we were I was gonna do volumes one, two, and three. But I already have like my list for volume two ready to go. But and I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek. But certain lines like Rakim meaning where you from is the way you add. Thinking mm -hmm. of a master plan is up for consideration. Brooklyn keeps on taking it is up for consideration. Like um, when I was twelve, I went to hell for snapping Jesus or life's a bitch and then you die. So because I, I got a lot of flack for Nas not being in Volume One, but again, it's not a list of the most devastating MCs. So and if you put everything in Volume One, what are you gonna put in Volume Two? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> And it's funny because looking at the list, um, you know, some of the lines, I'm just like, you know what? That is one of the most inf uh, uh, influential lines. Like, um, I like big butts and I cannot lie. I was like, <laughs> you have a point with that one. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, like um, another one that I really think you had a point with and one that I always tend to forget is the, uh, the Diddy line. Don't worry if I write rhymes, I write checks. Yeah. And then that, that Which line, I think, I think is really... Like I think that line has been one of the most not so, 
one of the most controversial, but the most controversial simply because ghostwriting, Meek and Drake going back and forth is prevalent right now, but ghostwriting has been something that's gone on in hip-hop since the inception of hip-hop. It's also something that nobody, no MC would talk about. So mm-hmm. if it wasn't for a, a Diddy, who would be the first to tell you, like, yo, I don't care, bro. Like, I'm my job is to do X, Y, and Z. I'm cutting the check for the rest. Go ahead. Nobody would even address the the whole ghostwriting part. It would just be kind of like a, a known unknown. Like, everybody knows about it, but we don't talk about it. Like, Diddy put it on full blast, and he's the only one who could have done that. Because yeah, no MC yeah. is going to be like, yo, somebody else is writing my rhymes. <laughs> Your career is over right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he definitely uh, opened the lane for, uh, you know, a lot of um a lot of people who don't necessarily write to, you know, say, "Hey, did he said it?" <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And again, but only it makes sense when Diddy says it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you better be Diddy before you start saying certain things that that they're going to apply to your life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and you know, it, it seems and, and I mean, and, and based on um, you know, your your Diddy entry, I mean, your book, it seems as if you were really like, you know, you were like that you were writing, like you, you were doing like last minute edits to this book, like right down, like the, down to the wire, since you do mention like the whole Drake and Meek thing uh, within uh, this, this one section. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's, uh, it, was a li- it was a living, breathing thing because hip hop is essentially is such that. And one of the things I want, although it talks about the history, I want to keep it as current and relevant as possible. So. That's kind of my writing style too. So like I'm always kind of like mentioning things where if there's so much entendres going on that you'll get it on the surface level. If you don't get it on the surface level, you may get it on like on on the subversive level. But I always try to keep things as current as possible. So had had the book been edited and still been had I still been writing up until last week, I would have found a way to get the the, the Troy Ave thing in the oh, book. Man. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So I was always like a living. I try to make it sure it's as current and recent as possible. Yeah, uh, man, that's what's up, man. And I guess um, you know, in closing, um, um, do you have um, you know, um, 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 anything that you want to tell to the people? I mean, other than the the usual, buy the book, go to One Track Mind, and absolutely buy the book. Like I really think if you're a hip hop fan, you will love it. I think if you're not a hip hop fan, if you love it. If you love art, if you love words, <laughs> it's just a good <laughs> it's really, I'm serious. Like, it's actually just it's an entertaining read, first and foremost. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the author. This is actually the feedback I've been getting. So I really do believe if, you like, if you're a huge fan of hip-hop, I'm trying to chronicle the culture properly. So I want the fans who appreciate it to go out and get it. And I think I really do think they'll enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we definitely agree. If you like uh, hip hop, you like artwork. I mean, the artwork is 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 a tremendous. Just next to the words, um, you know, illustrating what's going on, um, in the lines that you're talking about. Um, you know, we definitely recommend it. You can get that at uh, onetrackmind.com, and we'll throw the link up too. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely appreciate it, man. No doubt, man. Thank you so much for um, you know, gracing our podcast here, man. We really appreciate you. No, thanks for having me, man. It was an absolute pleasure. No doubt, man. No doubt. All right. So um, there we have it. Um, Albert OBEC, the crazed African um, in the building. Make sure you go out and uh, and get the book. You made it a hot line. Absolutely. All right. Doing, you too, man. Peace. Peace. Feeling this here. Yeah, son, you feel it, man. Roll up, son. You gotta just do it, yo. Yo, roll up, man. It's a different channel, son. Roll up, on, man. Roll up, watch the channel, son. Different plane now, man. It's all good. Roll up, all good, baby, in every hood, son. Roll up, yo. CNN, Network Channel 10. It's on again. Street niggas, it's grown men. Bold face, get in your face. Stay in place, yo. Crime lace. Cast more beef than Scarface. CNN, Network Channel 10, it's on again. Street niggas, this grown men. Bold face, gather your face. Stay in place, yo. Crime lace, catch more people.